and welcome to the final week of The Loft's virtual wordplay. My name is Caitlin Bolin and I am the Individual Giving Director at The Loft. We're so glad you're here. We hope that during the challenges of COVID-19 that this little corner has been a place of respite and creative inspiration for you. As you may know, when we began planning wordplay, our intention was to have 100 authors and 10,000 visitors celebrating books in downtown East Minneapolis. Well, with a quick and thoughtful pivot, we have loved the opportunity to engage with you at home, bringing you conversations with today's top authors on conversation topics across the spectrum. Because you have shown up for us, we've reached over 40,000 viewers across the country. We are so grateful to provide all of our wordplay sessions to you free of charge, and that is due in large part thanks to the forward-thinking generosity and leadership of our sponsors, and especially our founding partners, St. Catherine University and Star Tribune. We would not be here without them. And while their support has gotten us this far, we turn to you, our dear virtual audience members, to bring us to the finish line. This week, as Minnesota raises funds as part of hashtag give at home MN, and as we celebrate hashtag giving Tuesday now across the US, we ask you to please consider including the loft in your giving plans. Your gift of any size allows readers and writers to continue to receive support through classes, fellowships, events, challenging conversations, and more, all at The Loft. And your donation will automatically make you one of our fantastic members. We hope you will support us as we support the literary community. Thank you for all you do for The Loft, and enjoy wordplay. each. Um, welcome to the Lofts virtual wordplay panel space and privacy. Um, I get to be here with the amazing writers, Tracy O'Neill, author of Quotients, and Teddy Wayne, author of Apartment. Um, before we get started, we want to thank Wordplay's presenting sponsors, St. Catherine University and the Star Tribune. Um, their generosity helped to make all this wordplay magic happen. And I highly recommend both of these books. You guys, I would I mean, they are both amazing. They both have that amazing moment where you turn the page and you're like, I, I need to finish this tonight because I need to know what happens. Um, and you can buy both of them at the link below. Um, you can buy them, click on the link and it'll go through the lovely independent bookstore, Moon Palace Books. Um, so these are great books. Get them in your collection, do some, do some reading. Um, okay, so Tracy and Teddy, thank you so much for being here with us today. Well. Um, hear a little from each of your books and then have a bit of a discussion before opening it, it up to audience questions. And audience members, you can type questions into the comments or into the, um, into the chat feature. Um, and yeah, so should we get going? Sounds great. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, Tracy, do you wanna start? Uh, just give us like a little bit of an elevator pitch about quotients and then um, just read us a little bit from the book. Sure. Um, thanks so much for having me. Um, so my book, Quotients, this guy, um, is a novel um, about a couple um, who, after the 7-7 attacks in London, are trying to make their family work together. Um, Jeremy, the guy in the relationship, um, is a former um, intelligence operative for the British Intelligence Corps, um, and he's trying to leave behind that life but they find um, that surveillance sort of follows them everywhere and it creates a great deal of anxiety um, in their family. So, um, all right, so do you want me to read now just a little bit? Yeah, that would be great. Okay, so I'm just going to read the prologue then. Okay. He'd found a small way to resolve the future. The year he believed that, though in fact the belief would not last the year, was 2005. It was a various year when he trusted those who euphemistically might be called his cohort and then didn't, where he quit assuming a big resume in an ardor for details could occlude misfortune's gaze. He decided to keep stories to the rooms where they'd happened, but he also aspired to sensible collations of evidence, although, or in particular because, it was a time of perfect aberration. It was when he met Alexandra Chen. In his mind, there was a procedure to calm successions. It began with the call center, 
There you can rely on emergencies. And so the night before the year torqued, Jeremy Jordan turned on his headset, a red light in a grid lit. He asked how he could help, not in the manner of hopelessness. My life's action is gravity, Collar said their own ways. Help me catch what's falling. What's falling is me. His training was follow the slope of a suffering mind before it inflicts itself on the body, but listen to for what fills the air one cannot see. A source quivers energy off it, persuades the air around it to shake. Sound huddles waves into intimacy. That is the way of a voice or explosion, telephones. He could hear that somewhere in London, a woman lay silverware in drawers, knives slapping knives, matching. Signals, they were everywhere if you know how to heed them. There's some static, a rustle, the woman there and yet closer, and his ear at the center in her house, kilometers reduced, as she recalled that her husband slammed a door hard enough, a mirror shattered. He slammed it so hard, she said, the image of his departure rained down in shards. From the caller's unseen room, he heard reflections, noise returning. The word, it's thrown and it strikes off the surface, arrives in homecoming, a little different. Sometimes the waves ripple out, other times they die. It is water where the word travels clear, no man's land. Sometimes, she said she wished it were too late for her. He dispatched a mobile crisis unit. He aspired to totem comfort. He told her, you are not alone, meaning only more, any more than anyone else. Jeremy's head was heavy with the hour of the night and still to come was his putative real job at the fund, but he would remain on the line until the team arrived for her. And though his voice was reasonable, though his collar was crisp, this was talisman in action, superstitious math, offer safety so what life exacted from him would not be Alexandra. He listened to the stranger survive. He said, stay with me. So good. The image of his departure rained down in shards. I just, that line just like captured me when I started reading the book. I love it. Um, Thank you. Um, so to me, like quotients, and then Teddy will get to in just one second. Um, quotients kind of like stretches out in a lot of ways, like over years, over countries. Um, it's very kind of like big and vast, but can we just, dis can you kind of distill it to a small, like what was the initial spark or the initial impetus like was it a character was it an event what kind of started and how did it um like change as the book grew yeah well i had met a man who um either was or claimed to be um a former spy and um i was really interested in that psychology and how that feeling of having spent so much time watching other people um could open up the possibility that people were always watching you and that um, that would make it very difficult in a lot of ways to move through life um, with trust, but also understanding that, um, that there are these clandestine operations um, happening around us, that that is a political reality, um, also makes it really difficult to know what's true. And I think that um, those sort of, those two parts, um, those two aspects are really what advanced my writing, the book, yeah. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. um, okay, great. Teddy, can we hear a little bit about Apartment and yeah. hear from the book? Sure thing. Uh, Apartment is set in 1996. It's about two young men who are MFA classmates, Master of Fine Arts uh, in Fiction classmates at Columbia University, uh, and eventually decide to room together in a rent stable apartment that the uh, protagonist uh, sublets illegally from his great aunt. And so it's about their friendship, it's about um, the tensions that arise during the course of their year together. And it's about writers, inspiring writers and creative frustrations, but it's mostly about the two and the narrator who's unnamed and his uh, roommate, Billy. And I'll read the first page of it, uh, August, 1996. I was looking down at my lap, wishing I weren't there, when I heard Billy speak for the first time. I guess I had a different take from everyone else, he said in a baritone as flat as the Illinois topography from which he came. I couldn't see him as we were at opposite ends of a classroom, its windows wide open to alleviate the torpor of late August 1996. Should previous decades be defined by an article of clothing and an intoxicant, a gray flannel suit and a martini, 
tie-dyed marijuana, bell bottoms and hallucinogens, shoulder pads and cocaine. The mid 90s were relaxed fit gap jeans and light beer. An edgeless era of global superpower peace and American prosperity, sandwiched between the triumphant and calamitous falls of the Berlin Wall and the World Trade Center. The most inconsequential presidential election of modern times, Clinton Dole, surprised no one. The interregnum for mindless and all consuming scandal, a year removed from the double murder trial of a football player turned movie star, 17 months from the revelation of Oval Office fellatio. McVeigh, Koresh, Kaczynski, their obverses a brood of floppy haired matinee idols, each tending to his own private melancholy wound. And I'll stop there. Okay, great. Yeah, it was, you really captured the 90s throughout the book, aside from just that, the first page. Like, I really was transported back to a lot of like memories from that decade as, you know, the plots unfolding and everything. So the same way that quotients to me, I'm, I'm very gestural. So the same way that quotients is like <laughs> stretches, you know, in a lot of different directions to me, like apartment just like really zeroes in like on the two characters. And then really a lot of the action takes place in this apartment, this one apartment, mm -hmm. the apartment like moves the plot forward a lot. And, um, and then in the interior monologue of the, um, of the narrator. Um, so for you was the spark of the story, was it the place or was it the characters or a combination both? Or how did you, what's your kind of nugget of how it started? Uh, a little both, but very much the place. I had written another sprawling non-claustrophobic novel um, that I didn't publish. I ended up just giving up on it. Uh, about 500 pages into it, I gave up on it. And it was about, again, a friendship between two men who were MFA classmates and it tracked them over two decades of their lives. And it was unfocused and not a very good novel to be frank about it. And I lived in uh, what's called Stuyvesant Town in Manhattan for about 14 years or so. It's a residential complex in lower Manhattan. Um, I also had... It's okay. Yes. That was awesome. <laughs> I had of a, of a similar situation to the protagonist. It was a one bedroom, not a two bedroom. Um, and I realized I'd never said anything there or written anything about it. And so I decided to take that idea of this friendship between two men and contract it to Stives in town, set it over one year instead of 20 years, and then accordingly ratcheted up the claustrophobic tension, uh, which was kind of absent in another novel, but I could put to good use in these, these restricted confines of an apartment in this one. Right. Yeah, it's very claustrophobic for sure, especially as the book goes on. Um, the idea of privacy is very prevalent in both of your books and this idea of like the physical space we share with people, but also the emotional space and how and why we let people in. All the characters are kind of dealing with letting people in to a certain point and, um, and then maybe going beyond that. Um, what is it about privacy and um, emotional, you know, kind of emotional privacy that fascinates both of you as writers. Tracy, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I think that when I was writing this book, um, you know, I was, I was writing it um, after the revelations of WikiLeaks. It was sort of at a moment when I think um, as a culture, we were starting to grapple much more with the sense that we are, in fact, um, being watched all the time when social media had also um, become a more important presence in our lives. Um, when we under we're starting to understand surveillance capitalism, but also understanding even that mobile devices, telecom that we're carrying around with us um, is sort of uh, can be have an intrusive effect right in our day-to-day -day interactions and so one of the things that I was trying to explore in the book is how we need these sort of pockets of privacy um, to be able to connect with one another that although maybe in many ways we've been promised that um, you know the more information that's gathered um, that the more options that we have for connection the more close we will be with other people, but sometimes that is not the case. Um, so, um, so that's, I would say that's, that's one thing that I was getting at. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. No, that's great. Tay, how about you? Yeah. 
Uh, well, one of the motivations for writing this was I had read and enjoyed a lot of novels about female friendships. Uh, the Ferrante novels are probably the best known ones. And I felt like there was um, something uh, missing in the, in the novels about male friendships I was, I was reading or not even seeing that much of. And I wanted to write a novel about two men being friends, hoping it could have the kind of complexity I, I more often saw in female friendship depictions. Uh, but the big difference, of course, and this is maybe why the books about male friendships don't exist as much, is that men don't, this is totally generalizing, but have a harder time opening up to each other and have a harder time letting someone else in if it's a vulnerable issue, especially. Um, this is not to say men can't have close friendships, and certainly now they have, I think, probably better than they ever have before. Men are more sensitive and emotionally in touch with themselves. Uh, but this book is set in 96, so it's still in the sort of last gasp of men being stoic and invulnerable. And if there's something that they're ashamed of or otherwise feeling like they're not able to communicate to others, they might not even communicate to, to themselves, which is the, the narrator's problem in this novel, among many other problems. Um, so this idea of privacy and isolation um, was interesting to me in the context of a male friendship. And I think that in that part that you read, Teddy, um, I really love that so you invoke um, McVeigh, Kaczynski, and Koresh. And to yeah. me, those three guys um, really capture that sort of um, masculinity that's uh, very tied to privacy and how it can become mm -hmm. extremely toxic. So that was my comment. <laughs> yeah. And weirdly, I mean, it's odd to think about Koresh lived in a compound with I don't know how many people, Kaczynski clearly lived alone. Um, you could go sort of both ways, but I would imagine, I don't know too much about Koresh, but I imagine neither of them was really opening up to anyone, uh, certainly not Kaczynski. And I can't imagine if you're, if you're that kind of guy and these are extreme sociopathic or you know, deranged or deeply disturbed individuals, um, there's this kind of like isolation that men have that again, anyone can have, but uh, it can afflict and and really be more disturbing in in a male embodiment. I find. How did you, you say? No, go. Go ahead. No, please, please go, go, go. No, I was just going to ask if you watched Waco. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> okay. Well, that's on Netflix. It's not that good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did you guys um, thinking about? what you reveal about your characters. How did you guys decide on the, on your different points of view? I mean, again, with gestures, you know, Tracy yours is were kind of pulled back a little bit, seeing a lot um, of what the characters aren't necessarily, you know, this omniscient kind of point of view. And then um, Teddy yours is just so zeroed in on the narrator. Did you guys experiment with different ways of telling the story? Like, Tracy, did you ever go into Jeremy's mind? or have a draft like that? Or how did you zero in on these, um, these ways of telling the story? Yeah, so I mean, the, the novel is narrated in close thirds. So it sort of dips into the lives of many different characters. And um, I think that maybe a little bit like what Teddy was talking about before, there used to be even more characters in this book. And so, um, you know, I ended up um, streamlining a little bit, but still there are moments that we um, do move into the consciousness of um, Jeremy, who's the main character, um, and well, Jeremy and Alexandra, who are the two main characters, who are the couple. There's a young boy in the book named Tyrell, who ends up being um, a client of Jeremy's, um, whose point of view we dip into. Um, there's uh, you know, there's Lyle, who is the journalist in the book. And um, so I did experiment with having all of these voices. And one of the reasons that it was important for me to do that is that um, I think that so much of our life today is lived online um, and that we sort of operate um, in a way in which we're constantly hearing other people's voices, uh, maybe not orally, right? But where we're exposed to them. And I wanted to sort of get that feeling across of being constantly like pelted by different voices, different points of discourse. Hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Teddy, how about you? Uh, yeah, that earlier book, the 500 page book was in a close third person. 
And for this one, uh, given the claustrophobia, I wanted to evoke any kind of intensity of emotion I wanted to get at in the narrator. It felt like it had to be in first person. I guess it could have worked in third person too, but um, the narrator is already someone you're not that empathetic about, or maybe he's not someone you immediately root for, certainly. And uh, distancing from him would have made the reader even more distance in this first person point of view, at least. You have a chance of empathizing him with him to an extent, even if he's not the most likable narrator of all time. Mm -hmm. um, you guys have both um, had books come out before and have obviously promoted other books before. And what is it like promoting a book during a pandemic? I mean, you know, it's hard for everybody, but I would imagine it's extra, extra kind of kick in the gut when something you worked on so hard, um, you know, you're, you're kind of restricted in how you can get out there. Well, I think, Teddy, you've been sort of promoting your book more so far. I haven't done a lot of it yet, so maybe you can go first. <laughs> I, vo yeah. I, vo I volunteer you to go first. Sure. Uh, we came out a few weeks before the lockdown really started, so I had a time to have a few events in. Uh, you know, it's 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 sort of too bad, but there's worse things going on, going on in the world right now, so I don't, I, I'm not going to complain about it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, in some ways it would have been, of course, nice to be in person in Minnesota right now, but other ways you can reach people through this that couldn't make it there either. Um, so, you know, it, it also, I think, puts things in perspective. Um, when you have a book come out, uh, a lot of anxiety is usually wrapped up in it. And now that anxiety is very much projected elsewhere to, to other life and death issues. So it's in, it's almost a, not a blessing in disguise for something like this, but it makes you reassess, do you really care about a bad review of your book when things are going insane outside? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think also, you know, I, I know that speaking for myself, I'm very privileged in a lot of ways, like I'm healthy and um, I have been, allowed to work from home. Um, so, um, you know, many of my friends right now are unable to work um, and really worried about what's going to happen, um, you know, financially to them, um, are worried about their health. I think probably a lot of us have older people in our lives or other people who maybe are immunocompromised that um, we're concerned for. Um, you know, this book, um, is one that I worked on for five years. Um, and during those five years, I was also um, doing a PhD and which, and I defended my dissertation two weeks ago. Um, so there's, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so there is something that feels odd about, I think the sense of so many things ending at once in a way. Um, but I think that obviously you, you write a book hoping that it sort of has a longer tail, a longer life, um, maybe more so than a dissertation. Um, so, um, but I, you know, I, it's really special to be able to um, connect with people online. Um, I think that for myself, because I am somebody who thinks a lot about um, surveillance and digital privacy, and this is part of the book in so many ways. Um, you know, I do have concerns about these gatherings online um, and what that means um, for people's privacy. So for example, you know, um, I just logged on to Zoom to do this event and, you know, Zoom has been forced to admit that they have given people's data um, away to Facebook. So even people that um, are not even signed up for Facebook and maybe feel that they never consented to give Facebook information about themselves, um, you know, that is happening. And so um, I think that that's a tension that I feel that I'm navigating and that is also part of the book about our, the way that we, um, that we connect um, in a world that's changing and hasn't yet necessarily um, caught up in terms of creating practice, like best practices or like a legal infrastructure that um, protects people. 
um, it, it, you know, and protects people who are trying to connect to others, right? Um, and I think that there's something really fundamental and scary about what that means for, you know, our social fabric if we enter into um, acts of connection with fear. So I guess that's what I'd say about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of interesting the way that, that your book seems super extra relevant now that all of our social interactions have gone online. I mean, I'm Zooming all the time now, yeah. and, but, but it is our only social interaction when I mean, we are sort of forced that way and, um, but without thinking of the larger issues of it. Did you have to do a lot of um, research for your book in terms of like who is mining data from who and all that kind of stuff? Um, I did do a lot of research. So I was doing research, um, you know, on um, intelligence. I was doing research on um, the troubles in Northern Ireland because it's kind of part of the backstory of, of Jeremy. Um, but I also had been sort of um, doing a lot of this research in, in the PhD program that I was in. Um, I was very lucky to get to study at one point with Helen Niesenbaum, who's an analytical philosopher and specifically is um, interested in the issues of ethics and big data. Um, so, um, yeah. Cool. And Teddy, the same way that, you know, you're kind of researching all these, these modern, you know, companies and everything, did you, taking your book through a 90s lens, did you find yourself inserting things that you had to kind of check, like, is that accurate or was that actually something that existed in the 90s? Yes. Um, and there's a lot of sort of going back through maybe like old New Yorker issues to see what were people talking about in 1996, things like that. A lot of YouTube checking of commercials or, you know, events from the time to see what was on TV. Um, thinking about what books people were reading back then since they're MFA students. Uh, not, this is not nearly as intense as Tracy's research, but, but uh, a decent amount of, of a kind of cultural archiving or, or go digging into the cultural archives. Cool. Teddy, what was your favorite song or movie that um, you remembered from that period? Like in, in, in doing this, yeah. You know, I, 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 I was myself ending high school the year this is set, the characters in, in it are older than I am. Uh, and I don't feel like I was, oh, you know, I, I, I briefly referred to it, uh, the movie Kicking and Screaming, which came out in 1995, mm. reference to it in one scene. That'd be my favorite movie of the time. Yeah, I think that's probably Noah Baumbach's best movie, right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. We, we, we agree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what are you guys working on right now? And how is it kind of, is, is the lens at which you have been looking at it different since um, COVID-19? Um, I'm not working on a big fiction project yet. I've been sort of conceptualizing one um, that is, um, well, Anyway, me, I, I feel like I might be too early to talk about it. I'll say it has to do with brains. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, basically, it's, it, you know, it's sort of about uh, scientists who um, are making brain organoids. But anyway, I, I have a lot of work to do on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that is one that I think I, I'm going to need to do some more research on. Um, but yeah, I mean, the other thing that I've worked on recently is um, a personal essay, which is very much prompted um, by um, coronavirus. Um, and uh, it, it's basically about like uh, me I guess confronting um, the possibility of my birth mother's death during coronavirus and like not being sure if it had happened and sort of what that means. So, um, and kind of addressing, I guess, the fear of dying alone that seems to be one that a lot of people have. So, yeah. Okay, can't wait to read it. Tidy oh, thanks. <laughs> in a novel that is uh, very much about the current political moment minus the pandemic. Um, so sort of everything it could might as well be set in February of 2020 or any time before that, but not post. Uh, just because I don't know how to incorporate that without it feeling gimmicky at this point. We're still too deep into it. 
Uh, and then I'm also working on a few TV adaptations of previous books of mine, which have nothing to do with this. Oh, that's cool. That's pretty exciting. Um, and what are you guys reading to either to get your mind off of things, to relieve some anxiety or watching or how are you taking care of yourselves, you guys? Well, you know, I am, <laughs> I'm such a jerk. I really like, you know, I never read anything like light per se. Um, so I've been reading The Undying by Ann Boyer, um, who is a writer who I so respect and I'm interested in. I think that she is willing to make moves that um, almost nobody does, you know, so that, um, so that. Um, and uh, TV wise, I did watch Ozark recently and I really liked it. Nice. And I'm reading uh, an upcoming novel called Lake Life by uh, David James Poissant. Excellent novel so far. And after watching a few like post-apocalyptic dystopian TV shows, uh, one of them was Years and Years, which is set in the near future and is just posits that society collapses. Uh, I'm now watching Normal People, which is great so far and quite a, an escape from, from the modern world right now. That's good, yeah. Almost can't be too real right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so just a reminder that you guys can buy Apartment and Quotients, um, the link right down here. And why don't we open it up for some audience questions and see what everyone has to say. Hi, Steph. Hi, this has been so fun. Thank you all. Um, okay, first question from the audience. This is from Abby. It's a two-part question on pro tips. Tracy, best practices to avoid being watched online. Teddy, best practices for roommate searches. <laughs> <laughs> um, best practices for not being watched online. I mean, I think that um, there's a degree um, to which I'm a little pessimistic about people's ability to do that without um, really robust um, legislative efforts. Um, but I will say that there are small things that you can do that might mitigate some of the harm. So you can use DuckDuckGo um, as a browser instead of using uh, Chrome or Safari. Um, that's one small thing that you can do. Um, you can, um, I mean, I think one of the things I was trying to get at earlier about one of the reasons this moment is so scary um, for digital privacy is that, for example, you do have, um, you know, school children, right, um, whose only option for, um, for getting an education right now, um, which they're supposed to be doing, is to be maybe on Zoom. And so they are not consenting to give their information and, you know, once that has been bypassed, I think it's very hard to sort of like dial back without, um, you know, without it coming from um, substantive legislation. I'm not sure that I would say that there is, um, that we should believe that there is a ton that we can personally do with our own agency um, to protect ourselves, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then for roommate tips, uh, it's been a while since I've had to find a, a non-romantically attached roommate, but I would say don't live with a close, with a friend, unless you're so close. It's almost like a sibling relationship where you can yell at each other and not have hurt feelings. Um, otherwise, I think friendships fray very easily over the course of living together, as happens in this book. Oh, I would just have um, one more thing. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think that there are other small choices that you can do that maybe don't necessarily help you in a very direct way, but sort of can contribute to like a, a culture that is a little bit more resistant to um, the seizure of data. So things like, for example, like sometimes you're at a store or we used to go to stores um, and um, they might ask you about whether um, you'll give them your email address, right, to get your receipt. And you can say no, right? Like there are many times in which companies ask for your data um, and it's not necessary for the transaction. So I think there are small things that you can do that maybe um, have a larger effect in, you know, anyway, that's all. 
so pessimistic. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> just be aware. And we're all just online all the time. And again, just not really thinking of the consequences of that because you're in it for a little bit more of the instant gratification, right? Like I want to talk to these people. I want to see these people and not thinking about those larger issues. So it's good to bring awareness. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, this is not related to that, but I appreciated Tracy your like two sentence review of Waco. It felt very spot on. Um, <laughs> um, okay, this question is for both of you. Um, can you talk more about your creative process? Teddy, you mentioned throwing out a 500 page book. Tracy, you've been at work on this one for five years. So can you talk about sort of your, your crafting process of these works? Mm. Uh, well, I don't recommend th writing a 500 page novel and throwing it out. It's not <laughs> fun. The, the night you decide to abandon it is a bad night. Um, uh, for me, what's always worked is outlining, uh, thinking about sort of being struck by something. I usually then write a page or two and feel like I'm in into the idea. And then once I have a, a little bit of a head of steam, I'll start outlining and, and figuring out what's the overall arc of the story. And doing like a maybe two to four page loose outline that I can deviate from, but which serves as a guidepost for me throughout. Um, a lot of people don't go that way, but I can't imagine writing a full novel without having some sense of where it might go. You know, Teddy, if I did it your way, maybe it wouldn't have taken me five years to write the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I... I didn't like necessarily throw out a different novel, but um, in the revisions for, for this book, there was definitely one revision where I ended up cutting 75,000 words from it, which is, you know, basically like a novel and, you know, um, and I think that probably overall did cut maybe even more. Well, I definitely cut more than that. Um, so, um, but I think that for me, um, it's very sort of painterly in a certain way. So I'm constantly sort of like accreting detail and um, moving through the sentences and then pulling back. Um, so, you know, people ask me a lot of times about like my revision process. Um, and I think unlike a lot of other people, I don't sort of like write the whole thing and then just do a revision. I'm constantly revising, I'm constantly going back. And part of the reason that I'm doing that is because I'm trying to sort of like reread what I wrote so I can get the rhythm in my mind and be able to, to create a work that has a certain coherency, which I think that like in a book where there's so many different characters, you have to sort of like subtly get into places in which things remain the same and one place might be creating certain rhythms, right? So, um, so yeah, I, anyway, my point is that I am not doing, uh, I didn't do an outline or anything for this, um, but I'm just sort of uh, constantly moving in these loops through the narrative, like going back, revising, continuing on, going back, revising, continuing on. Mm -hmm. um, um, this question is for Teddy. How do you think your protagonist from apartment would be doing during this pandemic? Would life be <laughs> business as usual for him or would he somehow feel even more isolated? Well, it depends, I guess, uh, what era he's in. If, if, again, it said in 96, so one reason for setting it then was that was pre-internet, at least mainstream internet. So I want the novels about how we relate to each other without screens in part. Um, he, but you know, the, the book fast forwards at the end to modern day and he's still much the same as he was earlier. Um, he has not in some ways changed that much. He would not be doing too well. His isolation, I think, his emotional isolation would be compounded and reinforced and made literal. Uh, he was not the kind of guy who would have friends he could Zoom with or FaceTime with. Um, even so, even though life would sort of be business as usual in the sense of being isolated, I think he would suffer more for it, for not having those ties to, to the outside world. Um, I think we have time for one more question and I'm kind of loving that this is the one we're gonna end on. This comes from <laughs> somebody you may know, Ryan Chapman. Um, Ryan! Says, <laughs> what about your novel would make it a great Mother's Day present? <laughs> <laughs> Whose mother are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's say Ryan was going to get it for his mom. 
<laughs> okay. Um, well, I will, okay. I will say this. Um, I, I mean, at the heart of it, um, you know, quotients is about a family. Um, it is about love and intimacy and connection and people wanting to be closer um, and sometimes finding it difficult to do so. And so I think that as much as on the surface, it might be about like the internet or it might be about um, spies, um, you know, the emotional heart of it is something that I think um, possibly a mother or father or anyone could, you know, understand, I hope. I like it. Uh, and the, the working title for apartment was, in fact, Mother's Day present. <laughs> so, it, I don't know, it seems like it makes sense. Um, really quickly, I mean, I have this, like, giant weird water bottle. I wish I had, like, a beer on me, but I just want to cheers Tracy on your PhD. Congratulations. Thank you so That's much. That's so exciting. What a what an amazing thing to accomplish during a quarantine. Um, so congrats. And Molly, thank you so much for your amazing questions and for joining thank us you, Molly. today. Oh, thank you guys. Thank you for the, uh, the opportunity to read both of your books. They were so different, but so similar. And it was really fun to read them back to back. So everybody should do that. The link is a link. Um, yeah. But everybody. it was really great. So um, thank you and, so much for doing this. Oh yeah. It was a blast. Yeah. Thank you to, um, St. Catherine's University and the Star Tribune are presenting sponsors. Uh, we could not do this without them. Uh, we also rely on some audience support since all of these events are free. So please consider supporting the loft, the button below. Um, we have five more days of events for wordplay. Um, so check back in tomorrow. We've got exciting programming like this happening the next few days. Um, again, thank you to Teddy and Tracy and Molly. This was really fun. You guys can stay here for a minute. Everybody else will see you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you for coming, guys. <laughs>